on on behalf of the uh, income tax appellate bar association i welcome everybody and uh, all the participants also who have joined us with in at overwhelming response for this much awaited and much coveted speech by mr salve on the constitutionality of tax laws before we start the proceedings i just have a couple of announcements to make primarily being on more on the technological aspects i would request everybody to please keep their audios in mute mode and videos also preferably off except of the people who will be speaking or interacting with the learned speaker uh, and hopefully we all enjoy this session uh, in in all its gusto may i now request vipul to take over mr joshi the president of the uh, itat to start the proceedings thanks akim i uh, good evening friends it's really my pleasure to welcome you all by being one of the most pioneering and the oldest itat bar association we believe that creating and spreading awareness about tax law is one of our modern duties and to see that the majesty of justice prevails forever and with the suggestion and the encouragement of our senior most past president mr vip tuvedi our program and call committee your voice is cracking to come this challenge to hold this webinar and we would not salve means counsel and senior advocate the name and the face which is today synonymous with indian legal expertise to kick start this endeavor we are very much thankful to you sir for accepting our invitation to deliver lecture on the one of the most burning topics in the field of tax laws that is constitutionality and tax law and i must acknowledge the efforts of mr mehul sedani and mr ashok jain in making our dream true and we are also honored to have with us today honorable justice mr p p bhat president of itat who very gracefully and graciously accepted our invitation to be guest of honor my lord we are deeply touched by my lord blessing we also acknowledge the presence of honorable vice presidents and other honorable members of itat we also raise the location we are also grateful to our distinguished panelist also in the interactive session in the last but not the least our sincere appreciation to all india federation and the goods and services tax practice association maharashtra for extending the support to this noble cause without taking much time i request mr vip tuvedi to say his opening remarks which are tuvedi is a tuvani sangam of okay. the legislature he was member of parliament once of the judiciary was the most senior tax lawyers and of the industry the board of many companies in india to deliver his uh, opening remarks but before i do so may i request arti satir chairperson of the program and coordination committee to introduce the honorable guest of honor yes and thank you vipul yes thank you vipul uh, i have yes sorry yes thank you vipul i have been given the onerous task today of uh, introducing two uh, luminaries one is our honorable justice pp bhat and of course our uh, esteemed uh, distinguished speaker of the day mr salve i won't take too long though of course introducing them will take probably the entire lecture series so i'll keep it as short as possible 
Justice P.P. Bhatt started practicing as a lawyer in the High Court of Gujarat in 1984. After a practice of 10 years, he was invited to join the judiciary and appointed as a judge, City Civil and Sessions Court on 10 July 1995. Later on, as a member secretary of the Gujarat State Legal Service Authority, he worked hard, especially for the redressal of claims of the victims of the disastrous earthquake of Gujarat in 2001 through alternative dispute resolution method. He was the first Registrar General of High Court of Gujarat where he played a proactive role to bring about administrative reforms in the field of infrastructure, creation of new posts, use of IT in the High Court, as well as the District Judiciary. He was actively involved in the development of History and Heritage Museum of Gujarat Judiciary in the Gujarat High Court during the Golden Jubilee year. He has also worked closely with Director National Judicial Academy and professors of IIM for evolving court management plan. He was elevated as an additional judge at the High Court of Gujarat on 17 February 2011. And after working as additional judge at the High Court of Ranchi for a while, he retired from the High Court of Gujarat on 6 September 2019. We now have the honor of having him as the president of the ITAT since 24th October 2018. Thank you once again, sir, for joining this occasion and gracing it with your presence. I will now take on the extremely onerous task of introduction of Mr. Salve, distinguished speaker of the day. It requires, we all know Mr. Salve requires no introduction, but I must, as a matter of formality, give me a few minutes to speak a few words about his illustrious career. Mr. Salve graduated and joined JB Dada Chanji and Company in 1980 as an intern, and he has never looked back ever since. He has worked with legal stalwarts, Mr. Soli, late Mr. Suri Sarabji, and his role model, Mr. Nani Palkiwala, late Mr. Nani Palkiwala. And now he has rightfully secured a place in that league for himself. He has served the Indian judiciary as the Solicitor General of India from November 1999 to November 2002. He has been awarded with the Padma Bhushan and the most recent achievement, which I cannot not mention, is his appointment as Her Majesty the Queen's Counsel. If I am to speak of the landmark judgments in which Mr. Salve has appeared, I will need some more time than a couple of minutes. He has also been appointed as the amicus curiae by the Honorable Supreme Court in various matters. After being admitted into the English Bar in 2013 and subsequently joining the Blackstone Chambers, Mr. Salve's work is now a balancing act between London and India. We have also Mr. Kulbushan Jadav's case, which Mr. Salve has, has been representing, and several cases. I mean, this, this platform will be short enough time. I once again welcome Mr. Salve and thank him for joining us today and giving us his valuable time. Vipul, can you uh, carry on with the uh, proceedings? And I would also now like Mr. Trivedi, YP Trivedi, senior advocate, to please give his opening remarks. Thank you, Arti. Uh, the illustrious uh, panel which we have got today, my friend Harish Shalve, uh, Mr. Bhatt, uh, the uh, uh, president of the Income Tax Appellate Tribunal, other members, uh, vice presidents, and the other people here in the, on the panel. Uh, I have been given the very onerous task of introducing the subject as well as the speaker. Now there are two things. First of all, I introduced either the speaker or the subject or both. Now about introduction of the speaker, the RT has very rightly stated everything in great details. To that I might add a very little, except that I know Harish rather Harish more because of his father, because I was a friend of NKP Salve, and he and me together in Bombay High Court, we have had so many cases and indeed petitions which we have argued coming, emanating from Nakhu. And he was my very personal friend. Harish and myself, we had together in some of the cases of Singhanias and Harish has carved out a path for himself. Sometimes back, I remember a client came to me, introduced his uh, uh, friend and said, see, so-and-so wants your consultation and he is the Amitabh Bachchan of steel market. So sometimes we have got, got these milestones to, uh, to identify a man's success. If somebody were to ask me, who is the Amitabh Bachchan of legal profession today, I would unhesitatingly say it is Harish Shalve. 
because he has carved out a name for himself. And Arati has said so much about him. I need not add more to that. Coming to the subject, it is very interesting. The constitutionality of uh, tax laws is very important. If you recollect correctly, the entire American war of independence started with the slogan that no taxation without representation. Because they also wanted representation first and taxation later. From that, you know, during the times of George III, Emperor of uh, England, the war started and America got its independence. Now, that is a very important thing. We have also got our Article 265 of the Constitution, which says that no, 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 there can be no taxation without a valid law. And the valid law concept has been enunciated in Mafatlal's case very, very profoundly. So I think taxation is the main sinew of a state. If the arm of taxation is taken away, then the entire state can fall. The constitutionality, that is why the Constitution has recognized taxation as an integral part of the Constitution. Article 265 is very important, and we have very often filed repetitions relating to certain matters in the in, in courts, and where we have said that the law is violative of Article 265 of the Constitution because it is not a valid law for naming of the of the taxation. So I think constitutionality and taxation are interlinked. There can be no sovereign power without right to taxation. If the right to taxation is taken away, the sovereign power falls. So it is very important. I think I can say at great length, because I have filed so many repetitions uh, about Article 265. But today we have got a very eminent speaker. And the eminent speaker is going to speak about the constitutionality and tax laws. I do not want to trespass on his territory. So with these opening remarks, which are very brief, I would now request Harish to take over and give his address. Thank you, Mr. Harish. May I start? Yes, please do. Justice Bhatt, President of the Income Tax Appellate Tribunal. <clears throat> Mr. Joshi, President of the ITAT Bar Association. <clears throat> YP, as we know him and have known him for decades and had the joy of knowing him for decades. My father's friend and later <clears throat> I take pride in saying my friend. Members of the tribunal, <clears throat> ladies and gentlemen, I'm indeed grateful to Mr. Joshi for having reached out and to give me this opportunity of coming to share some thoughts with you. He asked for the various subjects on which one could, uh, on, on which he thought I could speak, and I thought. The one which caught my fancy was constitutional validity or constitutionality of tax laws. Constitutionality in the year 2021 has so many different dimensions. Half my life is now spent in a country which is considered to be perhaps the oldest democracy in the world, but yet it's a monarchy. And as great authors like Dicey remind us, it is incorrect to say that the United Kingdom does not have a constitution. The United Kingdom has an unwritten constitution. Oh. 
it is important to reconcile that statement that there could be something called an unwritten constitution. Listen to him. Harish Salvi. Come. Legal systems Aman such Rabi. as ours. Legal systems such as ours where we have exhaustive constitutions. Granville Austin once said that the Indian constitution is like a dustbin. It has a bit of everything in it. But today we realize that with the pressures of society and governance that we have in India, perhaps there are areas where we find constitutional silence, where perhaps the founding fathers should have spoken. And why do we find that gap in our constitution. Because unlike a law, which is made by parliament, which is written by parliament, which is construed by the courts, which is changed by parliament, A constitution is an attempt at legislating a philosophy. The constitution is always an attempt to capture into a semi-rigid form the aspirations of a people when they embark on the journey of democracy. Look at Europe. There are countries which have written constitutions, there are countries which do not. When Europe came together, they had the European Convention on Human Rights. And the British Parliament then enacted the Human Rights Act. And the Human Rights Act is what empowers the British courts to decide cases of human rights, which we call constitutional rights. And the courts have, the British courts have become one of the most powerful courts in administering human rights. In one of the most remarkable judgments, the UK Supreme Court put back Parliament in a session and asked them to deal with Brexit. When we always understood that it is for Parliament to decide when they should convene and when they should not. And this in a country which doesn't have a written constitution. Why do these things happen? How do these things happen? Because we have to understand a, conspiration, uh, a constitution represents the aspirations of the people. And increasingly, the judiciaries today read and understand the constitutions in that light read and understand constitutions as instruments of governance, read and understand constitutions as an attempt at articulating values which would govern democracies. Taxation and the effects of unfair taxation have in the history of the development of democracy been a very important force 
which has fashioned democracies. Mr. Trivedi mentioned the battle cry, no taxation without legislation. That was the cry in the colonies when in the name of the queen or in the name of the king in the colonies, those anointed with power would arbitrarily recover tax. The fable of Robin Hood, which today has become an idiom in the English language, when, you, when, when somebody does something good, you say he's playing Robin Hood. What was Robin Hood? He used to steal partly from the exchequer and give the money to the poor. Those of us, all of those of you who have visited the Netherlands would notice a very peculiar architectural feature of their homes, narrow long windows. And it is fascinating to know that the narrow long window, windows came into fashion because there was a tax on sunlight. And so the narrower your window, the lesser your tax. That is the genesis of taxation. And we have seen over a period of time a development of principles across countries of how the tax law should be fashioned, how tax law should be administered. And a whole constitutional ethos has developed around taxation. So let us start at the beginning. What is the first principle of taxation? And we go back to the battle cry, no taxation without legislation. In fact, the actual battle cry was no taxation without representation. No taxation without representation means if you do not allow me to vote, don't tax me. And I was surprised to find in the year 2005 when I had a rented flat in London, and unlike India, in the United Kingdom, it's, it's the tenant who pays house tax, not the landlord. So in the United Kingdom, I started paying house tax. And next thing I know is I found my name on the voters list. And I have been voting in the British parliamentary election from 2004, 2005, despite being an Indian citizen. That's the principle of no taxation without representation. No taxation without representation translates into the constitutional principle of no taxation without legislation. The first constitutional principle, therefore, is that there must be a tax strictly in accordance with law. The next step of this constitutional philosophy was the shadow of this constitutional principle on construction of taxation laws. Charging provisions must be strictly construed because you cannot have tax without parliament clearly making the subject liable to tax. When our constitution was written up, the framers of the constitution also had to deal with a very delicate task. In fact, 
the divide had been foreshadowed by the Government of India Act 1935, when we had divided the tax resources between the British rulers and the locally elected government. And when we wrote up our constitution, which was in a federal model, it is not a pure federation, but it was in the federal model with union and states. One of the first steps was dividing the tax resources between the units of the federation. And when we divide resources between the units of the federation, we had two models. Canada followed one model. So in Canada, the union, the, the federal government and the provinces can have similar taxes. What the Canadian court has therefore evolved is the aspect doctrine, that one aspect of a transaction can be taxed by the union, the other aspect can be taxed by the element of the federation. We followed a different model. We divided our tax resources into two lists of the seven schedule, list one and list two. One of the most potent resources when the constitution was framed was income tax, which again today is the single largest resource. And income tax was put in, was put in the union list. The second most potent resource at a time when India was not industrialized and therefore maximum taxation arose out of trading was sales tax. And that was given to the states. Property taxes was given to the states. Tax on mineral rights was given to the states. Excise and customs were kept back at the union because the implications of such taxes or on interstate trade was understood. Customs had to be the union because the boundaries were the boundaries of the Union of India. Article 301 guaranteed that the states could not have fiscal posts between states. There could be no customs duty for the importation of goods. Excise duty was kept in the union list because excise duty, it was felt, could become a weapon, again, of interstate discrimination. The first disputes which arose under our constitutional framework, as we all know, related to the understanding of these lists. So when dividends were taxed or when capital gains were taxed, challenges were brought to the Supreme Court suggesting that the entry in the legislative list, entry 84, was limited to taxation of income. And the Supreme Court dealt with it accordingly. Of course, they read the phrase income very widely, and therefore the court came to the conclusion that income has to be understood in its expansive sense. But one aspect which was not understood, one dimension of constitutional law which was not really explored till 1975, was, is there any area on which neither can legislate? Let's take capital gains tax. Suppose you give it a narrower interpretation and say a capital receipt cannot be taxed under entry 84. Does it mean neither the union nor the state can tax it? One is to divide it between the two, saying you cannot tax it, the state can tax it, the state cannot tax it, the union can tax it. But the other is, were there any gray, were there any black holes where neither could tax? 
and in 1975 the supreme court resolved that by saying no parliament has a residuary list and if something is not within the state list it goes into the union list and if you actually sit back and think but that must be so if parliament is a plenary legislature and if you take the amalgam of parliament and the legislature of all the states in a republic they must have the power to make any law they like any law how can you have a law of a subject matter not the effect of a law but the subject matter how can there be a subject matter on which a plenary legislature cannot legislate and if the plenary legislature can legislate then the list must be what the supreme court understood them to be in dilan's case then it must be that one of the two can legislate and seeing the construct of the constitution and seeing entry 97 it had to be that parliament would legislate after dilan we've never had any doubt about the legislative competence of a tax imposed by the union it is normally the states whose taxation has been subject to checks and balances the only two areas of legislative competence which then remain to be considered one was tax on agricultural lands and tax on agricultural income in the union list when the agricultural income was added for rate purposes the other was tax on immobile properties versus house tax because house tax goes to the states and uh, tax on income goes to the union and these were resolved much before the supreme court came into being as far as property taxes were concerned they were resolved in fact by the privy council and the privy council which understood the need of the stay of the colonies to raise resources found a way in which colonies could tax what at that time was a very important source of revenues house tax and so let it be said to the eternal credit of the privy council they came up with this innovation saying one is taxing the income and one is taxing the inherent capacity of the tenement to yield income <laughs> it it was the genius of the privy council which carved out a way in which we colonies could raise taxes out of what at that time was one of the major resources for revenues properties and that is how constitutions have developed the defining feature you will always see has been the attempt of the court to try and find some way in which neither unit the union of the federation is unduly deprived of its right to tax the Uh, hotel receipts tax case is a classic example the union had a tax on hotel receipts the states had taxes on hotel receipts the states called it luxury tax the union called it tax on receipts and the supreme court upheld both the principle on which they upheld both has been overruled but the tax was upheld the the aspect theory on which they upheld it of course in in the later case was done away with but what was the underlying reason five star hotels four star five star hotels revenue generating assets luxury expenditure the court felt 
we must allow both to tax it. And they found a way of doing it. The only remarkable judgment, and which actually is in the same thought, is the luxury tax case, Godfrey Phillips, where the Supreme Court held that luxury tax cannot be imposed on goods. And why and how did we persuade the Supreme Court to take that view? The ostensible reason you will find, the ostensible reason, the, 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 the legal reasoning which the court gave was partly adjusidum generis saying uh, the, the way the, it is worded, taxes on betting, gambling and luxuries means it's on activities, it's on provision of luxuries. But what became more serious, and this is the, these are the untold stories of constitutional cases. When the court saw the kind of taxes that were being imposed, air conditioners, refrigerators, all of them being subjected to luxury tax in states. And therefore, the court realized what was happening is, Excise duty, air conditioners are taxed at a high rate because it's a luxury item. And the state says, I'm taxing a luxury item. So the manufacturer, it is because when you say there'll be a luxury tax on air conditioners, what are you saying? There'll be a luxury tax on air conditioners and there'll be a luxury tax on the sale of air conditioners. So sales tax already exists. What other is the tax then other than the manufacturer of the product? And this is how, and, and then came the problem. State of West Bengal, I remember, which is the coastal state, would say that the moment the goods enter the local area of Bengal, it will be luxury tax, which means the moment it landed, the moment goods, what were defined as luxury goods, landed at the port in West Bengal, there'd be a luxury tax. Customs duty. And that is what the court realized, that if they allow this, what is luxury? As I remember once when I was arguing a case, Justice Mukherjee, God bless his soul, Justice Abhishek Mukherjee, he said, Mr. Salve, in our country, on a warm day for a poor man, a cold glass of water is a luxury. Sitting under a fan is a luxury. It, it, it's a very subjective thing, what's a luxury? Today, Lifestyles have changed, but there was a time. I mean, today, if you if you tell a 20-year-old that a cold glass of water is a luxury, he'll say, what are you talking about? Wearing a watch is a luxury, he'll say, what are you talking about? But we have seen times not very long ago, 30 years ago, where in a country like India, sitting under a fan was a luxury. We have, I've studied in a school where there were no fans. And in a uh, city like Nagpur, where the temperatures could go through the ceiling. So luxury is such an amorphous concept. And if you do, if you allow taxation on an amorphous concept, if you allow commodity taxation, it's a recipe for disaster. This is how the courts have always approached taxation law. The second limitation under our constitution is what we call the part three limitations. I have not seen any court outside India even entertaining a challenge to a tax law that it violates the right to do business. It was our court we did it. And we have to divide our challenge to tax laws discussion into two periods. There are two temporal sections of time. The first is when we had property laws in place. The second is post-property laws. The first challenge used to be, in fact, I remember under 19.1 F, that the tax is so heavy that it takes away my right to hold property. It's an unreasonable restriction on the right to hold property. That at least gave some semblance of a ground for challenge. 
When that was taken away, the 191G challenge was put in place. Now, we must keep in mind the sharp distinction between exactions, which were under rules or under subordinate legislation, which were challenged on the ground that these are an exaction. If it's an exaction, it's without the authority of law. If it is without the authority of law, it violates 191G because a, res a restriction without the authority of law is an unreasonable restriction. But beyond that, our courts have always accepted, by and large, the American principle, the power to tax is the power to destroy. Our courts have always deferred to the wisdom of the executive, to the wisdom of the lawmakers in matters of economic policy. And if anybody had any doubts about the correctness of this approach or the wisdom of this approach, as young lawyers we used to feel very frustrated when seasoned old judges used to say, not for us, that's for parliament. But when you look back over your shoulder and you see certain judgments of the Supreme Court now given, you realize how wise those judges were who said economic policy is a no-go area for the courts. And I will always mark two judgments of the court because we as senior members of the bar must also criticize the institution where it goes wrong. The one is the 2G judgment. Should licenses be given for a price or should licenses be given to increase teledensity to any and everybody who wants to set up a tele telecom unit. Who is to decide that? Is it the court? Or is it for parliament to decide? Or is it for the executive to decide? I can understand if you find an act of the executive tainted by arbitrariness or corruption. That's a completely separate ground of judicial review on which you set aside an action. Not because you question its wisdom, but because you question the manner in which the act has been done. But should licenses be given only to maximize revenue, who is the Supreme Court to decide? Coal mines. If you find there is corruption in the grant of a coal mine, please set it aside. Who are you to decide that coal mine should only be auctioned? See where we are today. India is importing coal when it has within it amongst the world's largest resources of coal. We have shut down all iron ore mining for reasons of environment. Is there an overlay of an economic philosophy there? Yes, there is. It's clearly so. Goa gave renewed iron ore mines. The Supreme Court said, no, you cannot renew iron ore mining. Auction them. What has happened? When you auction it, it becomes so expensive. Iron ore uh, prices in the world collapse. People start importing iron ore. And who is to decide? This is the economic philosophy. It's for the government of the day to decide. Corruption, of course. If, if an act is corrupt, you set aside the act. But you cannot say, and now you will give it by auction. It sounds very counterintuitive. But this is where the judges of yesteryears who upheld tax laws respected the wisdom of the legislature where it came to matters of economics. We always challenge under Article 14, Article 19. Uh, over the years, and especially post-78, the boundaries have disappeared. 
as you all know, we started in Article 14 with procedure established by law. We had the earlier Supreme Court judgments, which the only time the US Supreme Court in some of the earlier cases has interfered with tax laws is on the ground of due process. And when due process was sought to be brought in, initially our court said, please, when we framed our constitution, we did not bring due process of law. We have procedure established by law. Come 1978, the Supreme Court says, procedure established by law must be fair. So we had what is called procedural due process. And then the Supreme Court went on to say, no, the law itself must be fair and reasonable because 19 and 21 have to be read together. So it must be a reasonable restriction. So if it's a reasonable restriction, it must be fair. There we have due process in its full plenitude. But again, can we challenge a law as violating due process? How does a court say that a law violates due process? When can a court say a law violates due process? Yes, if the machinery for imposition of the tax is not compatible with contemporary standards of tax administration, that would be a very good ground to challenge a law. Natural justice, full hearing, natural justice, right of appeal to an independent tribunal, at least one right of appeal. And questions of law being resolved by the constitutional judiciary. As long as these broad tests exist, it would be valid. I know we now have very innovative steps in our tax law, faceless assessments, which have come in. How will these be reconciled with existing notions of natural justice is something which we have to see. And how do we build in procedural checks and safeguards that faceless assessments don't become meaningless assessments. The problem which plagues our administration, and I'm sorry, I'm again digressing from the narrow remit of the subject. The problem which plagues our administration today is the sense of disbelief, is the sense of distrust, is the sense of cynicism that has crept into our society. I remember my father used to always narrate a story when he was a young chartered accountant, it must be early 50s, he used to practice in Nagpur. And there used to be a law called the estate duty law, a very complex legislation. And he went to argue a case before the commissioner who called him and said that there is this old lady who's sitting here and she has an inheritance tax issue, will you help her? He said, of course I will help her. So she brought her papers. My father studied the papers and he went. When a date was fixed a week later, he went and he, as he recounts, he explained the case broadly to the commissioner. The commissioner said, fine, I've understood. He said, should I give you a note and all? He says, no, you give me the notice, not the note. So he gave the notice and he tore up the notice. And he says, yaar, ye desh, ye, that's how he closed the case. Today, if a commissioner were to do that, you'll have the uh, CAG on him, you'll have the CBI on him, you'll have the IB on him, you'll have a PIL on him. We have to build back the trust of the people in the system and we have to build back the trust of the system in the people. We have to believe in our judiciary at every level. We have to rebuild that trust. There was a time when, when you spoke of the tax tribunal. The tax tribunal, in fact, is one of the most remarkable institutions which has survived the ravages of this. From the time I was a youngster, I have seen the tax tribunal being seen with such respect by tax assessees. For some reason, and I practice in all these other tribunals, no other tribunal has been able to capture that magic 
which has been in the tax tribunal. And this is the trust which we need to build back in our institutions. This is the trust which we need to bring back. Today, the landscape of governance is changing. Norms of governance are changing. We have today, per compulsion, become an international unit with the WTO agreements, with the international trade agreements. We have to allow free trade in our country. We are allowed to freely trade with other countries. And India today has risen, is gradually rising to its place in the sun, has risen a lot to a, play, to a position where we are a player on a global stage. And by being a player in a global state itself is the biggest check and safeguard you have against arbitrariness. We have to resist the temptation of allowing our arrogance get the better of our good sense. When arrogance gets the better of good sense, you end up with retrospective legislation. Yes, there are cases where there are minor lacunae in the law, but there is a system of the rule of law that you make a legislation, the legislation is worked through the system, errors in drafting, if they lead to an escapement of tax, well, that's the part of the system. Rule of law is more important than a few pennies. Correct the law as we go on future. Don't make retrospective changes. Why? Because a law is a commitment. A law is a word of honor. Yes, if you find dishonesty, you may make a retrospective change. Or if there is an apparent error in the law, you make a retrospective change. But it cannot be that if the tax department takes a position and their construction doesn't find favor, you reverse the law retrospectively. And I make bold to say, what have we gained in Vodafone? Vodafone was decided by the Supreme Court in 2012. They haven't paid a farthing of tax. We are in 2021, nine years down the road. We lost the case in Supreme Court. They brought a retrospective legislation. An international tribunal has said this doesn't meet the standards of fair and equitable treatment. We are still fighting that. We are in the, India has gone to the Singapore court. We, India, a sovereign nation, has gone to a municipal court of Singapore, who one day may tell us that, sorry, your parliament had no business to do this. All this for what? Two billion dollars? And in the meanwhile, the word says, don't trust India because it makes retrospective changes in the law. There is a deep connection, an arterial connection between the rule of law and the stability of taxation law. People arrange their affairs on the faith of tax law. And the system is such you have faith in the way the system works. You go to a tax lawyer, he gives you an explanation, you go fight the case, you win the case. That's how the system works. Frequent retrospective changes erode the basis of this system. You may or may not be able to challenge a retrospective amendment on the ground of arbitrariness, but the damage you inflict on constitutional morality is immense. The whole world today is a different place. On the one hand, the Duke of Westminster's principles are rejected today. No country accepts that as the correct philosophy. We've had the group of seven. It's, it's ironical that in the, in the country of the Duke of Westminster, you have the group of seven ministers who say, how can we allow companies not to pay tax? And we must come up with international treaties by which the Googles and the Amazons of the world 
pay their fair share of tax. You've had the Organization of uh, Economic Development, the OECD, which has come up with international principles, one of which includes overseas indirect transfers as uh, being taxable. We have, have, we have now, in fact, our tax laws almost gone through a sea change with place of effective management rules, with transfer pricing rules and so on. Each state asking for its fair share of tax. We are today a part of a global team of countries and we are sharing resources. Resources are globalized, tax revenues are globalized. Each one wants his fair share. In a situation like this, we have to rethink how we administer our tax laws, how we enact our tax laws. I will only close by saying what I said in my last speech to the Institute of Chartered Accountants. This pandemic has brought us together as a country like no other event has. Today, you have seen a neighbor help a neighbor like never before. You have seen corporates reach out as like never before. When the oxygen crisis had, companies stopped producing and diverted their oxygen to hospitals. We Indians have come together as a race. We have worked with the government today, burying all our differences, burying all our mistrust. This is the occasion for what I call Operation Reset. And one area where it is sorely called for is the administration of tax law. I hope we can grab this opportunity, rethink, look at how the rest of the world administers our tax, restore the credibility of our tax, and at the same time, allow them the autonomy. They need to work in an atmosphere free from pressure. And together, I have no doubt, with the income tax bar, with powerful institutions like the tax tribunal, and extremely competent tax officers, some of whom I've had the privilege of meeting, we can change the entire image of India as a country where tax is a concern to a country where tax laws will be considered to be a friendly ground inviting you to invest in India. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, a very interesting and insightful speech indeed on the subject. Uh, with many things, uh, we got insight for the first time. So you have very uh, beautifully uh, explained, among other, the concept of due process of law, rule of law, faces assessment vis-a-vis -vis nature justice, trust in adjudicatory proceeding, uh, the retrospective amendments and the damage it caused, and lastly, the future roadmap the country should adopt. So it was very, we are all, so we are already crossed 1,600 due to BS, uh, just to uh, 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 praise you about the, 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 the coverage of this uh, today's lecture. Now, now with this, uh, now may I request, and my, it's my privilege to request Honorable uh, Mr. Justice P.P. Butt, ITAD President, to deliver his address. My Lord. Yes. Eminent uh, Senior Counsel, Recognized nationally as well as internationally, Sri Harish Salveji. My colleague, vice presidents and members of ITAT, president and other office bearers and members of ITAT Bar Association, Mumbai and other cities. Sri YP Trivedi, senior advocate, distinguished officers of the income tax department, other distinguished speakers, dignitaries and friends. It is a matter of great pleasure for me to be amongst all of you this evening, listening to Mr. Salve a stalwart in tax laws on the subject of constitutionality of tax laws. I am reminded of the word of Mr. Oliver Wendell Holmes that I hate paying taxes, but I love the civilization they give me. Taxes are the price we pay for civilized society. The above words encapsulate the thinking and outlook in a civilized society towards taxation. Rarely there can be a sphere of life which is not affected by taxation. 
thus taxation is an essential component of a civilized society and is also the backbone of nation's economy traditional system of taxation existed in our country since ancient times even in manusmriti there is a reference about moderate and rational taxation the great poet kalidas in raghuvansh said that it was only for good of his subjects that king collected taxes from them just as the sun draw moisture from the earth to give it back thousandfold the sanskrit word dand is the manifest of government's identity authority and consciousness arthashastra mention kosh mula dand which was adopted as motto of income tax department which means that the treasury and its inflow are the sources of government to do welfare of the citizens friends we all know that constitution of india is the source and foundation and can be termed as gangotri of all legislation including the tax legislation the supreme court is the final interpreter of the constitution as well as the tax legislation the term taxation is defined under article 366 sub clause 28 of the constitution and it has been held to be a mandatory source of revenue to be collected by the government for public purpose and for carrying out various governmental function of a welfare state article 265 of the constitution provides that no tax shall be levied or collected except by authority of law the power to levy tax is a sovereign function of the government and exercise of that power is controlled by the constitution the authority to levy tax is further derived from article 245 246 246a and 248 read with the three list schedule in roman 7 of the constitution of india the tax is enlisted in entries 82 to 892 are enshrined on the principle of federalism divided amongst the right of union and the state the strength of nation's economy depends upon the system of taxation which if levied and collected in a justifiable manner stimulates growth of nation and its economy it also helps to look after the welfare of its citizen very aptly mr salve has explained the nuances of the constitutionality of tax law as far as power to collect taxes and the limitations which are enshrined in the constitution similarly payment of due taxes also becomes legal obligation of the citizen this pandemic times has also shown how the taxes collected by the government can be used for welfare of the citizen in this challenging and critical time in 1922 historic enactment of a new income tax act to the setting up of a comprehensive taxation system with its own administrative machinery the income tax act 1922 gave for the first time a specific nomenclature to various income tax authorities in 1924 a central board of revenue was created to administer central taxes looking to the complexity of issues arising in tax dispute between the tax authorities and the taxpayers income tax appellate tribunal was created on 25th january 1941 which is popularly known as mother tribunal the role of the income tax appellate tribunal is primarily to ensure that the levy and collection of taxes is just and equitable which is found on its motto nispak sulab satvar nyay for past more than 8 decades the itat is ensuring that rules of collection of taxes are followed according to the mandate of law and no injustice is caused to the citizens of the country the judgments rendered by itat in an overwhelming majority of cases are upheld by the higher judicial forums therefore i can say with utmost conviction that itat has lived up 
adequate expectation in the eyes of all the stakeholders. I also ensure all the stakeholders that ITAT will continue to excel in its behavior to perform this function in times to come. ITAT has been set up step ahead in following the best practices in judicial dispensation system. ITAT has played a pivotal role by instilling confidence in not only the ordinary citizens, but also corporates carrying on their business activities in the country. By its advanced methodologies of justice dispensation system, such as e-courts, digitalization, <coughs> and virtual hearings, it has also been pivotal in promoting the policies of the government in enhancing the ease of doing business. We are witness to one more milestone achieved by ITAT by launching e-filing portal for benefit of taxpayers and revenue. It will facilitate filing of all communications such as appeals, applications, and evidences, etc., through electronics mode by a click of a mouse. In last few years, significant development of physical infrastructure across the country has also taken place, and at many places, the same is under progress. I am delighted that many professional bodies have come together today to host the webinar that will help professionals, taxpayers, and tax collectors to understand the constitutionality of our taxation system. I am sure this will certainly go a long way in achieving your mission of knowledge updation and professional development. I congratulate all these bodies, and I am sure that such a journey will continue. In the end, I express my gratitude towards all host professional bodies for giving me an opportunity for sharing my views on the constitutionality of Texas' system and role of ITAT. I extend my good wishes to all of you on this occasion, wishing you all a very happy and healthy life ahead. Thank you all. Jai Hind. Thank you very much, my lord. We are indeed privileged to have my lord's uh, speech. Um, my lord very beautifully explained the role of tribunal, the mother of tribunals in India uh, in dispersing justice and affording majesty of law. And my lord also uh, explained the latest move by the tribunal in embracing the technology in dispersing justice. My lord, we are indeed indebted to you, my lord, uh, for gracing this occasion. Now, may I request Aarti to uh, initiate the interactive section? <clears throat> yes, thank you, Vipul. Uh, thank you once again, Mr. Salve, for uh, giving an extremely enlightening and informative uh, speech to all of us. Uh, for purely lack of time, uh, this interactive session may have to be a shorter one because we have equally eminent people who I would like to invite on uh, today's interactive session. May I call upon uh, Senior Advocate Mr. Soparkar to please uh, tune in and please uh, switch on his video as part of the panelist, followed by uh, Senior Advocate Mr. Poras Kaka and Dr. Shivram, Senior Advocate, to please switch on and uh, please start this interactive session. Uh, Mr. Salve is also uh, uh, still there with us and we would really like to make the most of the time that he has given to us. I would at the moment request each of the panelists to start the interactive session with one question each. And if time permits, we can go ahead if, as per Mr. Salve's schedule. Thank you. Sir, I must firstly compliment you for an excellent speech, not only on my behalf, but on behalf of each one of us who is present over here. Let me deal with only one question, which is I'm sure everybody would be interested in hearing your views. Now, after Shaira Banu, Supreme Court has expanded the meaning of Article 14 power and even manifest arbitrariness is a ground to strike down legislation. Now, from that perspective, would faceless assessment and faceless appeal stand the scrutiny of the court from two different perspectives? One, as to whether or not I will get hearing gets decided by the respondent, especially in appeal, whether the CIT appeal would give me an opportunity of hearing, the principal commissioner who is responded in appeal will decide it. How can 
a respondent in appeal decide as to whether a judge will give a hearing to me or not? Would it not be manifestly arbitrary? And the second aspect over here is the order that may be passed by the commissioner appeal would be, so to say, a draft order, which will go for approval to the second commissioner. And if the second commissioner does not agree with the view of the first commissioner, it will go to third commissioner. Would the power of a taking a judicial view by a judicial forum can be subjected to reviews by different authorities, would it not be manifestly arbitrary? I would request, sir, you to give your views on it, because I'm sure everybody over here is very, very keen to have your views on this aspect, apart from a couple of other issues, which time permitting, I'll come back to you. Sir, you are muted. Sir, thank you so much for your kind words. Uh, I start with a caveat. I'm not very familiar with the uh, faceless assessment rules. But uh, with or without the expanded principle of arbitrariness, one thing is clear, procedural fairness, as in contrast with substantive fairness of a taxation measure, is something which the court has always jealously safeguarded. If an order is to be made to your prejudice, you have to be heard. With the consent of an assessee, if an assessee wants a fast-track assessment and he agrees to something like this, I can understand. If, if somebody wants to get it done over quickly and says, I don't want a hearing, let the system decide. You, you can have this kind of a system. But if somebody says, look, if you're going to make an addition or make a disallowance, and thereby increase my liability to tax, I have to be heard. I think hearing reasons and a right to appeal in 2021 would be considered the building blocks of fair procedure. And if these are taken away, I don't see, I, I, I think it will be very difficult to justify this law in a court which is hearing a constitutional challenge. Thank you, sir. Mr. Mr. Kaka, could we have your question, please? <coughs> yes. yes. Good afternoon to you, Mrs. Salve. It's such a pleasure to hear you again. I think, uh, I'm not sure if you recollect, but I think I started briefing you in 1988. First in the company tribunal, since then I've had the pleasure of working with you. You mentioned very interestingly that there should be a contemporary standard, for example, the right to natural justice as a test for the constitutionality of a, of, of a particular provision. I really have two questions. Is there any international precedent or anything where we could look for perhaps what is this uh, elusive uh, elusive standard and secondly proportionality i think the proportionality of a law is that a relevant test especially today i think sora was very kind when he only mentioned faceless assessments but we have a larger sword which is perhaps a faceless tribunal coming up but i think the proportionality when you shift for example the onus say under the black money act or a search which you have an objective but you shift the proportionality so much that you ask a person to prove what he possibly cannot prove. For us, always a pleasure talking to you. Uh, as, as I said, substantive provisions apart, where it comes to checks and balances in the fairness of administration, by contemporary standards. What is indisputable in 2021 is that there should be a, a unbiased officer making the assessment free from pressure, B, an appeal and C, full compliance with natural justice in both its dimensions, i.e. hearing and reasons. And I think anything less than that may not pass constitutional muster. Add to it one more layer of a faceless tribunal, as, as you mentioned. 
and you are only compounding the problem. The Black Money Act, well intended as it may be, I've had serious doubts about two areas. It is one thing to shift the burden of proof where you can fairly assert that the facts are known to the wrongdoer. And therefore, by shifting the burden of proof, you're not really causing prejudice. It's another thing to shift the burden of proof unlimited temporally for unlimited points of time. But there is another curious feature of this law, and I'm sure all of you must have analyzed it. I've, I was just asked by somebody for an opinion, and when I was working on the law, I realized if the object of the law is to bring to tax income which you may have earned 10 years ago or 8 years ago or 20 years ago or 15 years ago and the law therefore says that if you have an undisclosed asset I presume you must have had undisclosed income and therefore, the asset is evidence of income. But for convenience, I will tax you on the basis of the asset, not on the basis of the income. At the same time, the income tax law continues to apply. So if evidence becomes available that eight years back you had an income, you can still be taxed on that income. If you are taxed on that income under the regular approach of the Income Tax Act, the penalty and the prosecution is much lesser than it is under the black money law. And if that is correct, then are we breaching one of the most cardinal principles of criminal jurisprudence, i.e. creating an offense with retrospective effect and providing a punishment greater than the punishment when the offense was committed. Six years back, if I stole from the tax department and I had six months jail, today on the basis of an asset, you're going to tax me on that income and you're going to send me inside for two years. Have you not really increased the retrospective effect. Because if you can do it for tax purposes, why can't you do it for other purposes? You catch a public servant with money and say, now, if I catch you with money, this is deemed to be corruption. Correct? Unexplained. And if I catch you with money, I will send you to jail for 10 years today. Now, you can say, if I catch you with unexplained money today and you've been in public service, it will be deemed to be income from corrupt sources is another thing to say that if I had caught your corruption, then you would have gone in for seven years. Today, you go in for 10 years. Are we then really using the evidence of a past crime as a basis for imposing enhanced punishments? And this will raise serious issues of whether you can have this kind of legislation. It's, it, I can understand creating presumptions saying if I catch you with an asset and you don't explain where you got it from. The burden must be on you. But some of the things that I've seen, that they, when you go into the details of the law, some of the things you're right, which you're asked to explain, is really creating virtually an irrebuttable presumption. Because in, in theory, it is rebuttable. But it, if, if in practice, it is impossible to expect a person to have records of that standing, you're creating an irrebuttable presumption. So I think all this will have to be tested. I'm sure the law is under challenge somewhere. Thank you, sir. Uh, Dr. Shivram, if we could have your question, please. Yes. Yes. Thank you very much. Uh, the only thing I can say that I had occasion to hear Salve long back at Ahmedabad in one of the tax conference. Let me share it to you, sir. There we referred the judgment of the L.R. Gupta versus Vinayan of India, where you had occasion to argue on the search and seizure matter. And then that uh, constitutional divorce, uh, in fact, challenged and in fact, the, uh, there is that the, in fact, court awarded the cost on the officer. Of course, afterwards, you not got a single judgment like this on the search and seizure, we challenge and we search. That is, the, that is what I, at that time, it was still in my mind, although maybe about 10, 15 years back. Another occasion, we had occasion to hear you at uh, our members conference, ITAD 75th year. Where report of what of own and investment in India. 
coming out of that just consider i think our legend sri palkiwala in the year 1991 wrote an article maddening instability tax law there he gave the example the supreme court settled the matter to the tribunal after 42 years just consider the state today at least it it on the president is here we are happy that at least you know that when they say come down when you file the appeal within the two years we get the order i'll just say it is mumbai high court or appeal file in the 2002 admitted had occasion to argue for justice kapadi and just ap sha still not the final hearing and then the appeals it take nearly more than 10 12 years for getting final hearing for admission it take another 4 years or 5 years if this is the state of affairs in the high court our suggestion will be at least we wanted your view on this yesterday we want speedy disposal like court of course tribunal were able to get it so if this is the case after 15 20 years a businessman get the finality how can he able to decide is the investment in india is concerned is a business possibly because of this maybe the one of the great uh, i think lock on the investor's point of view he said he not sure when he'll get the justice on this and then is it possible to have for this speedy disposal to have the like ad hoc judges who are retiring can be appointed and the speedy disposal can be done that will that will be the we wanted your view on that because ultimately we want the justice should be done with a reasonable time it take 20 years 30 years i think possible i think the it may be very difficult for any person to invest in india what is your view on this you are absolutely right sir the india is considered a black hole when it comes to dispute resolution be it commercial be it tax and the one area where people try to make it first make, make things move quickly arbitration the the mindset of our judges who would love to second guess awards makes that also a very slow process let me not means any words i have been a trenchant critic of the tribunalization of justice you have expert tribunals whether it be the excise tribunal or the income tax tribunal beyond which questions of law can only be decided by constitutional courts so i don't believe in saying well if the high court has become a slower process abolish the high court and appoint a tribunal i personally speaking i feel the nclt itself is a step in the wrong direction but the nclt lat definitely is a step in the wrong direction this tribunalization of justice is not going to help what's the solution the solution is very simple we need more judges the a country like america has i think 100 125 judges a million the uk has 50 60 judges a million and here you have to i'm surprised people who sit in the next room here do commercial law and judicial review they say we are horrified the uk system has collapsed do you know it takes one year to get a case heard <laughs> they say it takes one one and a half year to get a case heard you're lucky you get a foot in the door in india and bombay today i believe if 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 you're not guaranteed ad interim relief and if if a notice of motion is made returnable in the normal course one year is easy for a interim relief I forget when the suit is going to hit hearing, and I'm I, I'm sure the situation in other high courts is no better. What's the answer? We need more judges. Now, why are we not getting sufficient judges? Please see the recruitment process, even for district judges. There are such large vacancies. We we have had this argument with, you know, of of all the people. Justice Varma used to be the most forthright. He says you must make, you should start looking, especially in the big metros. Calcutta, Delhi, Mumbai, where there's commercial law, you must start looking for lawyers who are 36, 37, 35, 36, 37 35, of age, because he says by the time a lawyer is 40, if he's still willing to become a judge at the current level of salary, obviously his work is not taking off, which, which is hard reality. And secondly, yes, everywhere in the world, being a judge involves a financial sacrifice. being a judge in in the united states is a financial sacrifice being a judge in united kingdom is is a, is a financial sacrifice no lawyers in the world make money the way our lawyers do believe me i see what people in the in the room next to me charge and what we people charge in india and and there's no comparison we are way way beyond any what anybody else charges especially our top rank silks in india 
but even then a judge makes much less money than a full practicing lawyer but he does but he makes enough to live a good upper middle class life and he doesn't have to worry about living off his savings and he continues as a judge till way way into the 70th year of his life 70 plus if he make these changes and i had also suggested i said you do it like you do here you create a specialized income tax court where you will have a charter accountancy of 15 years at the income tax bar as a minimum requirement and you pay a special allowance you have a technology court like you have in uk they call it the construction and technology court where there is a special allowance paid to judges and you will have engineers and management graduates and others who are joining the bar and and becoming aspiring to become judges and thirdly in india we must consider seriously should we have an all india judicial service all india judicial service not a state wide judicial service especially for commercial law and technology and where we take judge, uh, judges straight from colleges designed to teach you how to be a judge become a junior judge at the age of 28 or 30 and work your way up as a career judge and get good salaries we have to think outside the box and how much is it going to cost i remember at the risk of breaching the official secrets act i'll tell you i was sitting in a cabinet meeting way back in 2001 and where the supreme court had given a direction to increase the number of judges and of course all the political system was up in arms saying how can we do it just one singh ji god bless him he was the finance minister that time and I got a little whisper in my ear from the justice secretary says, sir, you please check his figures. What his department has done, the finance ministry, they have calculated like if Delhi High Court has to go from 20 to 40 judges, they have said they are present there are 20 judges. How much will it cost to build a completely new courtroom from scratch? And how much will it cost to build homes for 20 judges from scratch? And that way they came up with some huge figure of 7,000 or 9,000 crores for increasing the number of judges. And I told him, I said, sir, can I see your calculation? I carried a calculator. So he gave me his calculations just before the cabinet meeting began. I pulled out my calculator. He looked at me and said, what mischief are you up to, Mr. Chartered Accountant? I said, no, I'm just checking some of your figures. And believe me, in, in five minutes, the figure dropped from 6,500 crores to less than 1,000 crores. Because I said, look, if you want to add 20 judges in Delhi High Court, you need to add one floor or an annex building. Bombay may be different because Bombay, we have an old building. But there also, if you add 10 more judges to Bombay, I'm sure you can find space. You don't have to make another Bombay High Court to add 20 judges. You don't have to create a new Delhi High Court or a new Calcutta High Court to add 20 judges. So, you know, we need a will. If we have the will to fix our judicial system and no shortcuts, more judges, better salaries, better working conditions, Otherwise, we will live with what we have. Thank you, sir. Uh, Mr. Salve, we would be, thank you, the panelists also. Mr. Salve, we'll be happy to have uh, you for some more time and spend more time with you with some more questions. But subject to your schedule, I will invite more questions from the panelists. And I can I'll, maybe stay uh, another 10 minutes. All right, that's a great thing. So uh, I would request the panelists if they have some more questions. I'm sure there are questions going on in their head. We could start with Mr. Soparkar, Mr. Kaka and Mr. Shivram. And uh, Mr. Salve has graciously accepted to stay with us for 10 minutes. So we can have another set of questions, please. Sir, a short question on the morality of taxation. Now with the expanded scope of Article 21, Puttuswami's judgment, would even right to life not be that particular right not be invoked in case of a retrospective legislation or rate of tax being exorbitantly high because how can you expect people to live with a situation where suddenly they are being told 20 years down the road that law is exactly contrary to what you were believing would that principle be applicable over here it depends if it is a tax on an individual and the the consequences are huge 
you never know. Uh, with today's standards, the court may well want to consider a retrospective tax because if it basically the tax is the tax on your savings and what you put away. And it, if it snatches, if, if, if the extent of the tax snatches away your right to live with dignity and the right to die with dignity, it may be a case of Article 21. Thank you, sir. This is only only one question. In the international arena also, India is uh, tremendously resistant to arbitration, both under the investment treaties or under the direct tax treaties also. And they view it as a kind of a infringement on their sovereignty. But once you sign a treaty itself, you do give up some part of your sovereignty. Do you think that uh, there is a possibility that uh, this may change going forward? Because otherwise, the delays in the court systems may make it impossible for, for many of those who invest or who want a faster outcome. See, yeah, what you're asking is very interesting, uh, Boris. India first came up with a philosophy of uh, tax disputes are not arbitrable under BIT. And the then finance minister, who's one of our eminent colleagues, he put this on the file in the Vodafone case. They, of course, India has argued the construction point and failed. The next question is, what about a BIT? When we sign, and we've been signing these for decades, the Vienna Convention on Consular Rights, which we asserted against Pakistan successfully, didn't you take away from Pakistan's sovereignty? When an international court is saying you have to allow India to meet a prisoner, are you not overriding their domestic law? When we went and fought the ban on overflights case, did we not erode their sovereignty? The sovereign right of a nation to control its airspace. Day in and day out, we have the satellite treaty in which different countries allow satellites to operate in bandwidth in their countries. Are we not foregoing a bit of our sovereignty by agreeing to satellite division? And if we didn't, you'd have radio chaos in the world. When you signed the World Trade Treaty, did you not give up your sovereignty? Because of today, you know, if there's a dispute with the WTO, it goes to an independent adjudicatory body that India's laws are not compliant. So today, this kind of a assertion of sovereignty is reminiscent of the times of monarchs who considered themselves lord and masters of all they surveyed. Look at Europe. Even today, after Brexit, Britain has not yet walked out of the ECHR. So the European Convention on Human Rights still applies in the UK. Now, is that not an erosion of sovereignty? They have now, under the Human Rights Act, a declaration of incompatibility. And if there is a declaration of incompatibility given, and that is, so the UK court can't strike down plenary legislation, but it can declare it incompatible. And if that is not addressed, you can go to a European court and get a judgment against England, which is enforceable. Now, United Kingdom is a, is a sovereign country. Haven't they given up their sovereignty? We have signed the UCHR, Convention on Human Rights. Have we not given up our sovereignty? So I don't understand. When it comes to investment treaty, you are again assuring an investor. And what are you assuring the investor? That a bunch of independent people will decide whether what we have done is compatible with standards of equitable conduct. What's wrong? So, you know, this whole argument, this, oh, you, this is assault on Indian sovereignty. I think it, it, it's an assault on Indian ego. It's, it's nothing more than that. And in today's day and age where countries have worked together and we have to work together, we have to work together as one nation. Can you imagine today if every country decides to steal the vaccine formula and make the own vaccine, what is going to happen? What's going to happen to your pharmaceutical? India is the pharmacy of the world. Why does India succeed? Because our drugs are manufactured, sold in other countries in an internationally regulated regime. What's going to happen to us if this is taken away? India is the biggest supplier of IT. 
what happens if the intellectual property right protection is taken away from intel uh, from it technology so you know we have to realize you can't say where it suits my uh, interests i am happy to be in a in a treaty but where a treaty gets decided against me i am against this in fact i would i would i would really think the government of india should think of international disputes to be resolved by a panel of arbitrators instead of this useless map procedure you and i have seen the map procedure it gets you nowhere so i think you know this requires a rethink and this this narrow view or oh, this is a invasion of our sovereignty all of us have given up sovereignty we have agreed to international waters we have agreed to contiguous zones we have allowed people to pass we have all mutually agreed to 200 kilometers we go and set up 200 kilometers which overtakes part of sri lanka they also agree to it the world will collapse if every country was to put sovereignty over governance through treaty all right thank you thank you sir dr shivram would you have any question or we can close the interactive session considering mr salve has last question to one all right only thing is that uh, what i found that one article by our chief k venugopal our attorney general see the access to justice india at that time he wrote this a publication of it it is one year so it take 10 to 15, law we make so many laws it take 10 to 15 years you know that the for getting the justice is impossible so then he said they should separate fund for judiciary my only question is that in fact one of the chief judge shared with me suppose they want four staff when he sent recommendation they get the ultimately after six months or nine months they get only two at the time that increase would be more than 10 but that is how it is is it possible to have as a tax consultant we are making every year to the government make separate fund for the judiciary so that they don't have to go every time you know the asking that sanction they sanction this is it possible to have like this the in the our indian democracy all right every year this much fund is given for the judiciary and automatically it is the chief justice who can recommend it from that they can able to get it that is one suggestion that is one of the that's one of the major suggestions financial autonomy for the judiciary you are right Yes, that, that is the only possible that no let can we are able to improve the function of this country thank you thank you thank you the panelists and thank you uh, mr salve for this very very uh, interesting interactive session may i now request uh, mr trivedi to give his closing remarks you are on mute mr trivedi you are on mute sir Please unmute yourself. No, I am not on mute. Now, now you, now we can hear you, sir. No, Arthi, what I was saying was that we have trespassed so much on Mr. Salve's time, and he yes, was generous sir. enough to say that I'll give you ten minutes more, which Absolutely. he also exceeded. We are behaving something like the parliament, and I think that is something which I resent very much. Being in being having been in parliament at times, because I was so he has given us so much food for thought on so many issues, and on every issue I have got something to comment upon, including even two G where I was a member of the joint parliamentary committee, and uh, he has talked about the vanishing trusts. He has talked about the uh, inadequacy of our judicial system. so much can be said i think what we need is a is a detailed discussion and i don't think i have the 10 minutes or 15 minutes which you give me for this uh, concluding remarks i can do justice to what he has dished out to us so i think at the moment i will only say that he has to be thanked for him sparing his time because normally i know that if salves uh, time professional time was to be taken to nobody who could have afforded this much time but he was good enough to give us that time and i think i must also go for another reason i have been getting phones from home my wife is not very well so i was to rush home also so i think i was concluding here thank you thank you sir thank you so much may i request thank mr you. joshi to please take over uh, uh, thank you sir in the beginning i welcome you all 
to a very wonderful session and my prediction turned out to be wrong it has turned out to be a super wonderful session sir we have crossed more than 1700 youtube viewers apart from zoom invitees and we have been still receiving lots of requests for further question to be raised i'm sure we'll have benefit of all the distinguished uh, digital students including mr sarve the honorable justice mr pp bat mr trivedi and the distinguished panelist for one one more session in uh, time to come um it my pleasant duty now to propose a well deserved what a thanks to all the dignitaries my first uh thanks to the honorable justice mr pp but president of igat who very gracefully accepted our invitation and deliver his address our of course our thanks to mr hari shalve for a very very wonderful session and i am sure lots of issues which we never heard before got uh, we got insight for and so clarification my thanks to also to the distinguished panelist who within very short time agreed to be with us and to make the interactive session very lively and interesting my thanks to also our supporting organizations and last but not the least my thanks to the team my team the person behind the scene who tires tirelessly worked to make this session successful para saula Raul Akani and Maitri Saula, and of course, my thanks to all the participants who showed their so much interest in such type of sessions. And I'm assured, I must assure that we'll be meeting you soon with further such type of interesting and illuminating lectures. Till then, good night for everybody, and thanks to everybody again. So we end this session with this. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you all.